Well, good morning, everyone. And it's nice to see you all this morning. Uh, before we begin our study, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this day and for the time that we have this morning to open your word together and to receive light for our feet. We pray for each person searching for truth. We know, Lord, that it can be difficult in this world of information, um, and there's much that we do not understand. But we know that you can lead those who are searching for truth, who are willing to follow where you lead, that you can lead them. And uh, we ask this for ourselves, that we can understand the truths in your word amid the many voices clamoring for attention. We pray, Lord, that your voice can stand out, and that your Holy Spirit can speak to us. Be with us now as we open your word. Help us to understand these things, lead in this discussion. Bless each person, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, good morning. Now, um, need to get to Judges. So we've been dealing with Judges chapter 9, uh, dealing with um, the line of Jotham, uh, which is in response to Abimelech. So technically, Abimelech is the judge, right? I mean, he's taking the place following Gideon. But uh, the way that we've understood this is that this is Jotham's line um, in that Jotham is uh, not a judge, but like Samuel Snow, he takes that place uh, after the empowerment of the first angel um, in, in, in symbol, not literally, um, and spanning to um, the period after uh, the, the arrival of the second. So that's how we look at him. Now, he's not there in that history. So Jotham is giving a prophecy that then is related to this line. So that's how we're understanding it, that he's prefiguring something, just as Samuel Snow's uh, letters are prefiguring something, right? which is, of course, October 22, 1844. <clears throat> now, um, so we've dealt with some of this, uh, of course, in, in previous studies. And I'm not sure why that's not working. My bar is not coming up at the bottom of my screen. I can't change screen. So um, I can't look at my, my Bible. Um, so probably it's this way, I guess. The menu bar at the bottom is not showing up here. Can you even? No, something's frozen up on my computer. Looks like it's not responding. Ah, there it is. Okay, it's now responding. Um, so we looked at the parable. And so one of the things we understand about Joseph is his connection to um, uh, the prophetic mirror. How is Jotham connected to the prophetic mirror? Anybody remember? No, he represents the 70th week. That's kind of in the middle of the mirror somewhere. Okay, so he represents the 70th week. 
also, we had talked about how Jotham, who is the father of Ahaz, that the prophetic mirror begins with this civil war that begins in the time of Jotham. So we're just taking the name Jotham and connecting it to uh, the king of Judah, whose name is Jotham. So they have the same name. So we can we can use his name as a symbol in that sense. Now, um, so this this um, this parable um, we we really haven't interpreted it yet. We we've had some ideas. I mean, it can set, represent the first, second, third, and then the fourth angel's message. Um, but I, I'm still not sure how to to really understand this. It could be referring to uh, the period prior to Jotham, um, the previous judges, and and what we could say then is, if the people wanted a king, none of those judges offered them a king, and, and we see this quite explicitly with Gideon, right? So Gideon does not want to be a king. He's not going to be a king, right? So we could just say this represents the previous history of the judges, where we have these judges, but they don't become kings. Now, Abimelech is going to be made a king. I mean, you know, at least in a limited sense, right? Uh, because we know that uh, in the Abimelech's conspiracy here, that it's when they're, um, they made Abimelech king, right, by the plane of the pillar that was in Shechem, in verse 6. So he's definitely a king. So there, there is a king in Israel, um, really for the first time. Right? So we should be able to see that. Now, the kingship also becomes an issue in, in that whole history when we get to Saul, um, because that's going to start this period where the land doesn't rest. Uh, so from the time that they get a king, whether this is literally the case of how it works, but from the time they get the king, that's where they're going to count uh, the 70 sabbatical years that are missed that are then going to be served for the land with the captivity of Daniel in 607. So Saul's anointed in 1097. But this precedes this. We don't know the exact year. We don't have enough chronological information to tell us the exact year that this occurs. Um, but this is the first time they have a king. So it's going to be a while before Saul is anointed king. And, and so the fig tree must represent, uh, or the, the, all of the fig and the vine represent those previous histories. But the bramble, this really illegitimate uh, son of Gideon, is going to be made king, right? So, I mean, that would be the simplest way to understand this. But now we have in this... In this parable, we have this 3-1 combination. Now, if we think about this parable just in the context of, of uh, Jotham giving this, uh, this parable. So we have Jotham, we have Abimelech who's made king. We have Jotham who is speaking against it, right, with this parable. And I think I got the names mixed up for a bit there earlier. I can't remember. But so we got Jotham who is giving the parable, right? And and so we're going to connect that to this prophetic mirror that begins in the time of Jotham, specifically his son Ahaz, that the mirror begins the 65-year prophecy. But this is just when his dad has died, right? So his dad dies, Jotham dies. Ahaz is made king, and the first thing that it appears happens is Isaiah is sent to, to Ahaz to tell him about this. So, so you could technically put this in the time of Jotham, 
that the prophetic mirror begins, the 65 years begins with his death. Um, but this Jotham here is representing Samuel Snow, right? Or at least, in a sense, this movement in a particular way, right? So we know that this whole line of the judges is about this movement. But this is about a message that survives this killing of these 70 sons of Gideon. And this one that survives is the one of the 70. It's the, it's the one week, right? So it's the, it's the week of Christ. And so if we're going to give this to a message, we're going to have to say that this is the week of Christ's study, right? If it's, if it's a message, that's what the message of Jotham is about. Correct. Okay. Now this week of Christ's study, we came to understand, is is something that preceded um, time setting in this movement. That is the week of Christ study. Originally, I did it in the spring of 2018, and and I developed it um, through the summer, and then in August of of 2000, from August 6 to 11th. Um, I presented the week of Christ study in Alberta at the camp meeting that Jeff was at, where he mentioned um, Stephen's study on uh, the, the the time of Christ in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to 1844. So the time that he spent from uh, Pentecost to October 22, 1844. So Pentecost in um 31 AD. So so before we had, you know, Tess's time setting and everything, we had this week of Christ study. And the week of Christ study gave us the date, the first day of the first month in 2030, right? And so we spent a lot of time going through this and showing how this all connects us to the story of Ezra. It brings all of these lines together. So this this week of Christ study we would have to say, is this message of Jotham. It seems pretty clear. Now, remember, in the week of Christ study, one of the things that it was, was the prophetic mirror. That is, we could take the week of Christ, and we could line this up. And still, my menu is not coming at the bottom. I can't get into anything. Not sure why. Ah, finally it's showing. Oh, don't know why. Oh, and it disappeared again. Something's going on with my computer. Sorry about that. I've been trying to bring up the um, the file there, but I can't. <laughs> Maybe if I do it this way. Zoom menu, did you press Alt? Um, okay, well, now it's showing up, but none of the, uh, nothing showing on it. So just hang on a sec. Sorry about this. <clears throat> but I need to show you the diagram. We'll do it this way. Doesn't show up. Um, don't know why. Oh, there it is. It's finally working. I have no idea why it didn't work. Okay, so when we get to the week of Christ study, um, let's see if we can get there quickly. So this is a this is the week of Christ study. 
And in the week of Christ study, we know we have the prophetic mirror. Now, the week of Christ study, of course, is connected to the 70th week, right? Because this is the 70th week. And so it's connected to Jotham, who's the 70. He's the one left. Uh, 69 are actually killed, even though it always talks about the 70. And um, so when we looked at this week, in, in my original, once I had taken this time, I, I don't have time to go through the whole study, but I looked at the letter, literal 1260 days on either side of the cross. And I found that um, if we go to the day of atonement in this week of Christ, it's going to be September 30th. That's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month, which would start the 70th week, but it's 46 days longer than 1260 days. And so I recognized that this was then um, uh, the part of the prophetic mirror. And I could even take the, the 19, and that's going to bring me to September 11th, 1863. What I did is I put the dates going left to right to left on the bottom with the years, but the days going left to right on the top. And the confirmation of this was 70 AD being the 10th day of the fifth month, in this structure, 468 days after the cross. And, um, of course, this goes to um, Daniel chapter 9, where we have the destruction of the city and the temple connected to the, the midst of the week, right? So, so this was a confirmation that this worked. And then what we did in this week of Christ study is we could continue on with the years going this way, bringing us all the way to... Uh, the first day of the first month. So um, and let me see here. So the one I need is the different diagrams of this. So this is the one right here. So you can see I have this. This is an old diagram, but you know, I took the days of that week. So we're going um, here at the top. You're seeing the 17th day of the first month, 14th day of the first month, 13th day of the first month, 12th day. Of the first. I didn't put all, all of them. And you can see I put at the bottom of the years. The years are going this way, but the days are going this way. And so if we go to the first day of the first month, that's March 28th and 27 AD, right? But the first day of the first month in 2030, the year that lines up with it is April 5th. So, so we've already connected this with the story of Ezra. Um, so that's just a chart that shows that. So this was noticed um, before I knew anything about uh, Tess's time setting. But I just, I kind of just dismissed it. I just, well, you know, we can't go that far into the future, 2030 because we were in 2018. So I looked ahead to Judas's betrayal and there was different ways in which I could figure this out. One was to take it in our time, but we don't have to do that. We could look at April 8th, which is uh, the 12th day of the first month. That's going to be Judas's betrayal. It's going to be the Wednesday in the week of Christ. And um, that Judas's betrayal is is going to be um, that uh, you know connected to the twelfth day of the first month in four fifty seven BC as a symbol as well, but that's where we're going to get um, this April eighth date. So that's that's going to be April eighth, twenty nineteen. I could have also used April eighteenth if I had changed it into our calendar. So there's different ways I could have done this, but uh, the point is I made a prediction about Judas's betrayal. I didn't know whether it'd be April 8th or April 18th, but it ends up being April 8th. So that's going to be right when Jeff retires <clears throat> for that five months. Okay, so, so if we're going to look at this as the week of Christ, we're going to look at Jotham as this week of Christ study. Then in the context of these passages right so in the context of this story of this parable 
Um, what what does this parable mean then? What what are what is this? How does this relate to the week of Christ's study? This parable about, about these trees. What would be the warning to this movement? What would be the purpose of this? What is the 70th week showing us through this parable? How does, how does this would relate to the week of Christ study in our movement, this parable? Well, the only thing I can think of is um, the baptism, um, the uh, the cross, and then the resurrection. Those are the three things that I I think of, but I, I'm not sure that this is where you're going. No, I I don't think that's where I'm going. I don't I'm not sure I even understand what you're talking about. Um, well, it's the week of Christ, right? How does it yeah, start? It starts with his baptism. The cross yeah. is in the middle. Yeah, and then and the stoning we, of Stephen is in the at, at the end, right? Yeah, and so we could see that there are, I mean, if you wanted to attach it to Jesus' baptism, we know that what happens after his baptism, he straightway goes into the wilderness, and for forty days he fasts, right? And then, right. And then Satan's going to come to him and he's going to have three temptations, right? Which he's going to reject. Right? So he's going to pass that test. So we could look here somehow that there is this test that Israel or the, the, the judges pass, but Abimelech is going to be made king. So this is kind of an anti- line of Christ, an antichrist line, if you want to put it that way, with the bramble becoming made king. I mean, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna make that application there. But yeah, we, we have this whole week of Christ. The week of Christ though is, is fairly comprehensive because it deals not just with Christ's um, you know baptism and his sacrifice and his resurrection, but also deals to the end with the three and a half years going to uh, the stoning of Stephen when he closes probation for the Jewish nation. So, so this is a rather complicated, um, uh, you know, application that we have to make here. Um, maybe it's not as as direct as we would like. So. So to understand what this message of Abimelech is, it's a message in this movement that is about control, right? You know, having a king. Now, I don't yes. know. Yeah, so I yes, agree. Yeah, so it's I'm not there. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not sure if we really have, um, you know, I mean, I don't know what's going on in the movement as far as organization. Uh, and I don't think it really has to do particularly with organization. But the idea of, of closing down discussion, um, would at least align with that. So a message that is, well, it's, it's rejecting um, the message of Gideon because the message of Gideon is produces these 70 sons, right? These 70 sons represent a message. The 70th week is something that survives the destruction of that. I hope this isn't too, too abstract, right? What, what we're trying to do here. 
But if we're going to see uh, this, this that Jotham represents uh, the seventieth week, that message of the seventieth week in this movement, the week of Christ study, and we know that the sons of Gideon, so Gideon represents the message of July eighteen. So the sons of Gideon are are then attacked, right? So this would be the understanding of chronology, and we can see that it's attacked. Now, maybe we could just relate this to the December uh, 6, 2020 declaration by FFA against time setting. And the thing that survives is this week of Christ study. Because this is this is the thing that, in a sense, uh, started it all. It's the cross of Christ. It's it's the twenty five twenty. It's the prophetic mirror. It's this truth that ties all these things together, and this this survives. And that ties, that ties Samuel Snow's letters, of course. Huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It it ties everything together. Everything, you know, the week of Christ study was you know fairly much neglected by the movement um it was seen a bit as threatening by uh bronwyn and, and some others they didn't like it um because it was competing uh with this because when they set up the time setting um so 70 prophetic weeks of year 69 prophetic weeks. so what why is that uh, there, Iran. What are you trying to put there in the chat? It's just a reminder that the sixty-nine and seventy are equal. Oh, right. So seventy prophetic weeks of years and sixty-nine Hebrews weeks of years. That is, um, that's the biblical. There, well, they're equal. Not exactly equal, but close enough to be equal. They're thirteen days apart which is the difference between the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, by the way. So the difference is uh, if you take 13 days, that's 18720 minutes that separates these two things. But um, yeah, so these are symbols of July 18, 2020. Um, and so if we're going to look at what Abimelech represents, it would represent the tendency in this movement to control um, and to actually fight against the message of Gideon, right? So to control messages in this movement. Now, Jotham, his, his response is, um, well, I, I guess maybe we could call it a correct uh, time will tell uh, sort of application. Because he's saying you're going to see the results of your decision, right? If God is leading you, then that's fine. But if he's not, um, then you're going to have some difficulty. Now, of course, he's leaning heavily towards that what they're doing is wrong. Um, because and, and he believes that, you know, fire will come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And, and then fire will come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. So, so this is, so since we know it's not of God, this type of, of issue, we could take this as a prophecy that this attack against what we're doing as far as understanding chronology, understanding the prophecies, understanding the lines, um, that these will, in the end, they won't succeed, right? Because God won't be in, in what they're doing. Now, if we're going to try to put these things then on a line, um, so we have this line here, which we call Jotham's line. And I'm still not sure. I mean, I put Bramble down in the, as the third message arrives. But I don't know how to use Jotham's line. I mean, 
Because if you look at the judge's line above, right, we're saying that Jotham is that, I mean, technically it would you would put, uh, you know, Gideon and then Abimelech in here, and then you would have Jotham's message to, but we don't put Abimelech as one of the judges, even though in a sort of technical sense he is, um, though he becomes a king, but he's not really appointed by God as a judge right? He's a self-appointed judge. And even here, we don't, we don't put Gideon's sons, but we include them in Gideon. So Jotham happens to be one of them. And, you know, we could say that, um, that Jotham here happens after the empowerment of the first angel, just like Samuel Snow's message after 1840. He's going to rise with that message. And then um, he's going to, and his letters specifically are going to uh, address October 22, 1844. And then he's going to have his last published letter uh, before midnight, as three days before midnight, the July 18th letter. And so somehow we could, and here in this line above, in the judge's line, we have all these, these dates so we're saying that the second angel is going to arrive under Tola and Jair and under the message of Jephthah, it's going to be formalized. And, and we have these dates here that relate to December 6th with Jephthah, Jephthah December 6th, 2020. Um, and so that would be midnight. And so somehow this Jotham line uh, precedes that formalization. And, and this would make sense, Right. If, if what we're saying is that this message of Jotham is addressing this um, you know looking for a king we already have December 6 2020 as basically uh, this coronation of of Abimelech with this message um, of Jotham opposed to it is that making sense to people? Any comments? I would say that it's logical. Yes, because normally what we would do is we would take um, uh, Jotham, so I'd go like this. I'm just going to copy this and use this dotted line. You know, and we would just say, if it's paralleling Samuel Snow's letters, you know, it's something like this. Right? So it's something like, you know, like that. It's, it's just, now Jotham himself, right, as a, a message, I mean, he's not a judge, right? So he's just he's just after Gideon, um, but he's pointing to something that we could then look in the judge's line, um, and line up with December six, twenty twenty. So, so we we need to understand a bit more about Jephthah, yet to understand that history of why we put Jephthah's December 6, 2020. Because right? Jephthah is a judge. But remember what, what happens with Jephthah. He's going to represent a message that is um, first rejected, right? Because he's the son of a harlot, so he's going to be cast out, shunned, right? But then they're going to call him back, and, th and they're going to want to make him king, right? A, lead, a head and a captain. Um, basically, well, it doesn't say exactly a king, I don't think, but that he's going to rule over Israel, right? 
So, so there's a lot dealing with Jephthah that we, we struggled with, and we're not going to go and look at that right now. But we, we line that up with December 6, 2020. Whether that was correct or not, but that's how we did it. Right? So December 6, 2020 is... Um, we lined up with the judge Jephthah because of what happens there. So, so it seems logical with what we have already done to take Jotham and, and put it as that message that happens after 11.9, right? In the sense of how it's... Uh, as it occurs within the message. It's, that's where it's going to have its part to play. It's going to be accepted um, to some degree in the, in the movement. Or at least have its place in the movement. But then it's ultimately going to be rejected on December 6, 2020. Any more thoughts about this? So, so we have this line down there. But, I mean, we don't have any uh, verses. Line. Daniel, your mic keeps turning on and off. You got something going on there. Um, so any idea how we should proceed with this? How can we take this line of Jotham? Can we make it into a line where we have a period of darkness that occurs in this movement and that this message arrives at a specific time? Isn't the darkness them wanting to make him king? Okay, so that's possible. Okay, so if if the darkness was meant to about him becoming king, well, how would we then draw a line on that? I mean, Abimelech's going to become king. You're saying. So Abimelech becomes king. That's the darkness. Well, that's uh, yeah, um, that, that's a shot in the dark. Okay. Well, when does Abimelech become king in this movement? Or really, maybe we should say, in in this context, there is a conspiracy for Abimelech to become king. Right. So when Bim, Abimelech becomes king, I mean, there's this conspiracy, right? So could we look at this conspiracy and somehow place it in this movement for Abimelech to become king? Where did this start? I seem to recall you, you mentioning um, the secret uh, emails that used to be going around and that was with Perminder and um, those folks okay so so if you look at this chart yeah so when we're when we're looking at this chart we have 11 9 but we also have 9 11 right remember the problem that we had with Samuel Snow's letters what was the problem with Samuel Snow's letters as far as applying it to our history Because Samuel Snow's letters begin before April 19th, and April 19th we have it as the first day of the first month, right? And we also put 9-11 as the first day of the first month. 
So when we first had Samuel Snow's letters and we tried to fit it into our history, we see that it happens after 9-11. Like that is if we're going to put, so, so, but we also have it happening before 9-11, right? So we have two 9-11s, right? That was the, that was the problem that Jeff and I were struggling with in 2018 when he came up to the camp meeting. So we had a discussion about it. And, and he says, well, Samuel Snow's letters have to start before 9-11. But remember, we have two 9-11s. We have one that's the arrival of the second angel and one that's uh, the empowerment of the first angel. So the solution to that is to, to recognize that there's um, that there are these two way marks that really are are this represented by the same event, so they must be separate lines, right? And so we could then zoom in and we could turn nine eleven into eleven nine on right as we zoom in, right? So. Uh, I think that's quite well understood. So when I look at Jotham here and I have him here after 11.9, can't I take him and put him before um, 11.9? That is, this 11.9 here, I mean, here we have the arrival of the second angel. So, but, but this 11.9 is the empowerment of the second angel in a sense right so no we're kind of mixing up lines a bit here but if we take jotham i mean he's comprising much more than this narrow history that's all i'm saying because this narrow history is us just zooming into uh a way mark but this, this message of Jotham, this, if we look at the arrival of this method, message of Jotham, then, like if I'm going to take this dotted line and line it up with this dotted line, I mean, this is going to start much earlier than events after November 9th, 2019. Now, it may, in a, you know, in a sense, be able to be put here symbolically but not literally. We wouldn't say that Jotham's line starts on some date after November 9th, 2019. So we would have to figure out what Jotham's line is doing, what this line is representing. There's a first and a second and a third angel's message, right? There's three messages. And it's addressing a darkness that exists within this movement. And that darkness has to do, we say, with Abimelech, Abimelech's conspiracy. Do people follow what I'm what I'm saying here about Jotham's line? So, so you brought up uh, there, Ron, about uh, what happened when Tabo uh, was my roommate. Right, that there was this. Uh, conspiracy going on with Parminder, you know, that I wasn't allowed to hear about, you know, which I didn't mind. I'm not that important a person or very curious or anything. I just thought it was odd that they could have a secret Bible study that was exclusive. That's not the way I would operate. But later on, we could see that behind it, was a conspiracy and that um, 
Now, Jeff, how far back did he say that uh, this relationship between uh, Terry Lambert and, and Parminder went? Did he put that to 2012? To that that study of the time setting for 2014? Does anybody remember? Nobody remembers? Because I know somebody talked about it. So how are we going to define this darkness? Is the darkness going to be the conspiracy? Not really knowing the actual turn of events, um, but it, it does seem somewhat logical that this conspiracy that we keep talking about did have a start at some point. I don't know exactly when that was. Okay. I'm assuming that it started with that or prior to that email correspondence, secret email correspondence. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we have somewhere we have a conspiracy. We can't date it here at this point, but now we're going to have Jotham's line. So Jotham, Jotham's line is going to be a message that arrives it's going to be formalized and it's going to be empowered, right? And that first message is going to accomplish a work that will then bring about the arrival of a second message. And then that, that second message has to do its work. It's going to have a formalization and an empowerment. And then there's going to be a third angel, which is going to be a close of probation. Right. And we're saying that this Jotham line relates to the 70 weeks, not just the 70th week, because, I mean, Jotham himself is symbolizing the 70th week. That is the week of Christ study that message. But we don't know if, if that encompasses this entire line or if, you know, it's the arrival. It arrives at some place in, in this line. Now, the way that I would look at it, see, I would like people to be able to do this instead of me doing it. That's why I'm trying to give you time to do this. But, you know, I have a different perspective because I have my own perspective. And, and I don't like my perspective to necessarily color how we look at this line. But to me, this line is a personal line. Because when I look at this message of the week of Christ study, that's, that's something that's actually tied up with many, many things that I studied. And um, so the week of Christ was just an outworking of, of other studies. And, and these studies would, you know, for me, they go back to, well, 2000, you know, at least 2014, if not earlier. Because first I get the prophetic mirror understanding. So that's going to be in uh, 2000 and, uh, well, 2011, 2012 in there. Uh, I can't remember exactly what day I figured out the prophetic mirror. Probably be 2012. Um, and I definitely started presenting it in uh, the summer of 2012. So understanding enough to draw it out and, and explain it to people. And, and definitely by October 5th, I had uh, done lots of presentations on uh, the prophetic mirror at the 2,604 um, years of the prophetic mirror. And so there was lots, lots of things tied up with that. 
Um, and whether that's the study that I would first start with as saying that the first message arrives, I don't know. But I would look at this as the messages that I was giving um, in connection with the chronology. So in 2014, I also end up presenting at some, um, you know, so that's, so maybe that's an empowerment of a message or something, or is that a formalization, right? You understand what I'm saying, that we have to look at this as a specific message, but it's also addressing a period of darkness. And, and the question is, how does the week of Christ study address that conspiracy? If we're going to say that it's Parminder's conspiracy, how does the week of Christ study address that? Just in a general sense. Anybody think how it does that? You know, during that week of study or that week of Christ studies, you were fleshing things out at that point. Um, can we say that about the second point? Okay. For that darkness. I mean, we were you were fleshing it out on the week of Christ. So that adds to um, an upward motion of light at like at the front there of that little chart. Okay, well let's let's look at at Judges 9 again. So Abimelech the son of Jeroboam, so he's the son of course that came from this concubine, right? He's the son of Jeroboam, uh, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jeroboam, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. So if we look at these 70 sons as the 70 weeks, this is also symbolic of really this whole message of, of light that comes to God's people, right? So this is, this is a broader message. And, and we would say, you know, just in the context of this story, he's saying, well, you're going to have 70 people. Wouldn't it be better to have one, right? Wouldn't it be better to have a king? But the other option in the week of Christ is that, that there is this um, individual responsibility, right, to understand God's word. So, so how is that implied in, in the 70 weeks? You know, if we're going we're gonna to take this 70 sons as representing the 70 weeks. Um, but we also see that we have this conspiracy. So he's he's going to conspire, and and it's the men of Shechem, right? So we know that this is uh, the blessings and the curses, right? So we can say uh, that Shechem represents uh, the message in this movement related to the twenty five twenty. And so Abimelech, he's, he's going to be conspiring with this other message. <laughs> so when we deal with Abimelech's conspiracy, because remember, with, we've already dealt with Parminder, um, his message, because that's going to be the message of Sisera. But this is a conspiracy that this is spanning a bigger span of time, right? It's, it's encompassing something more. It's not just 
I mean, it's literally have to, happening after the time of Gideon and, and before Tola and uh, Jair, right? So, so we could then sort of, um, you know, we, we could just say it, it fits there in that time, but we can see that it encompasses a bigger span of time, that it's going to reach back to the time of this conspiracy. Right? And we see these with these way marks when we expand them as lines. They're not, they're just not, some of them come, encompass the whole line. That is, they go right from 9 11 to 2023. So, because you can zoom into that line and you can see that a line typ typifies the entire, a way mark pardon, typifies the entire line. And that's, that's just something that, you know. Sometimes it's a little bit too hard. It's a little hard to visualize, but but we can see it once we look at a line, because it's it's zooming into a particular way mark and expanding that way mark. It's understandable that it can represent the whole line. We see that with Samuel Snow's letters; they represent um, all the way up to October 22, 1844, and even represent our time. So, um, so we have this conspiracy, it's, it's being formed and it's the men of Shechem, which would be connected to the blessings and the curses, the 2520, the uh, message. Um, but it is appealing to um, a message that's appealing to pride. and to jealousy, right? And then we're gonna have this, they're gonna hire um, these vain and light persons using uh, 70 pieces of silver. So, I mean, the 70 pieces of silver, I would assume that each piece of silver would be paid for the death of one of the sons of Gideon, right? So in a sense, each one has a piece of silver uh, that's being paid for his head. So then we have, um, and this is, it's paid out of the house of Baal Bareth that's, that's you know, Baal's covenant, Bareth means covenant. So we can see um, this conspiracy, you know, has existed before, you know, before uh, it has to occur before these 70 sons are killed. Um, but what would be the representation then with the 70 sons being killed? Why the men of Shechem doing that? I mean, you'd think the 2520 is connected to the 70 weeks and to the week of Christ. We've already seen that it is. But there would be a spirit or an attitude, an idea or actions that really are represented here in this message of Abimelech. So it says, he went unto his father's house in Oprah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jeroboam, being three score and 10 persons upon one stone, notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jeroboam was left for he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. So if we're going to, so I, I just can't help but personalize what I see happening here. Even though this is not about people, this is about messages, but yet people can be tied to those messages. And so when I look at the message that I was giving in regard to chronology, This is going to be 
rejected, not by Jeff, but by people in the movement right from the beginning. There isn't an interest in what I'm doing and, and for different reasons for different people. Right. Sometimes it's jealousy. Sometimes it's people don't like numbers. Right. There's lots of different reasons. Um, but there, there is this idea that we need to consolidate the movement. We need to bring it together. It needs to be this organized unit. We can't just have people going off and doing their individual studies. Um, you know, the movement needs to be organized. That's going to be ultimately what ends up happening. This, this movement towards uh, organization. And we know, of course, Parminder is going to be uh, behind that. And a lot of it, too, has to do with messages that he was, studies that he was doing, that pushed this idea that we needed to be organized, which I didn't agree with. So I, I, I was against the organization of the movement into a church. Because we would just become like the church. We'd be doing the same persecution. Of course, we saw that same spirit. I never seen in Sister White's writings that um, whatever came out was an organized into a church. It was already part of the church. Yeah, well, there's a thing called gospel order, right? Now, gospel order is um, a part of organization, and, and it's, it's needful, but it's not organization itself. Right. In the sense of, you know, an institution, institutionalized religion, because you can have gospel order and not be an institution, you know, government recognized institution. Right. Well, you don't need the government's recognition <laughs> to be of God. Right. So. But that's really what was being pushed for. It was, well, we in a sense already had an institution that was a government institution, which I've always been opposed to um, uh, corporations, especially religious corporations. But, um, you know, and there's a reason why the church organized in the way that it did in 1863. We know because of the Civil War and other expediencies. But to a large degree, it was because the church had departed from the truth and was laid to see and that it had to or organize. That is, organization was a representation of the failure of the movement, is how I understand it. The movement had failed, and so they had to organize. And, and that, to me, was what I would see is if this, this movement was organizing, it was organizing because it was failing for the lack of unity yeah because if people aren't connected with christ well then you have all kinds of crazy things going on so you organize to to help bring some order to this so you can accomplish some tasks now organization for the adventist church uh the main primary reason it was organized besides the civil war and the draft and that was really so that we could organize a work to get the message to the world Right, so that that funds could be collected and distributed in a um, an organized fashion, right? And th and that always seems good, right? Organization always seems like a good idea, except that organization can be counterproductive, so, especially on a national level. Well, well, when it's centralized, right? Yeah, so that's what I mean. Yeah, Ellen White wanted it to be decentralized. I mean, that's what she was pushing for in that's in, my understanding. You know, one, right? That everything, all the decisions were being made at Battle Creek. And the idea when you read what Ellen White says about organization is that individuals need the power to make choices and act on their own without having to, you know, ask permission from above. 
and and so you know and it, and it, and you see this with policy and, and over principle right organizations tend to run with policy so they they believe that they're operating out of principle they set up these rules we need to have things done in this way and they set up policies but these policies just basically um uh, you know slow down the progress of of the movement right of of the things that are being done they they handicap the people who are actually actively working in the field yes i agree yeah. so you know decentralization um, of an institution is important for it to function properly uh what the institution can do is provide means and funds and help and encouragement and so forth and information communication really that's the biggest thing about an organization is it creates lines of communication right and uh when tabo well, that's how you organize is through communication yeah so tabo had this organizational meeting at one of our camp meetings that's in the summer i can't remember what year it was probably uh 2015 if i remember correctly but it could have been 2016 um but um it was the most ridiculous thing i'd ever seen um because he was trying to create a structure of different groups in different areas but he had no form of communication the simple thing to do if you're a leader is you communicate with your members you take time to talk to people on the phone you take time to visit people um you find out what the needs are you connect other people together to do things organization is a very simple thing if you're a leader and 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 you learn to delegate you learn to give other people's responsibilities and the freedom to to do things and and you give them support and you communicate with them you get feedback from them you hear their concerns right that's what an organization is about it's all just communication it doesn't matter what office a person has um you know people just think they get an office of you know an elder and all of a sudden you know that that's but if they're not doing their job i mean who cares what you call them if they're not visiting the church members they're not doing their work um the title means nothing right so I know we're kind of going a bit off track here, but when we look at the message that was being given in relationship to the understanding of prophecy, um, it was threatening to the message that Parminder and Tabo were giving. Now, why was it threatening? What was there about the stuff that I was studying, why was it threatening to Tavo and Parminder and what they were doing? It conflicted with their ideas of how things should go. Yeah, and so there's there's some basic principles that were involved in my study that were opposed to principles that Tavo and Parminder and those were using. So what are those principles? What were the principles they were operating under? Protestants are, versus uh, Millerite understanding. Okay, so they were believing that truth comes from the top down. Right? Mm. That's yeah. why they were organizing. We need to organize so that we can control the message. Right? So instead of recognizing it's that- fire speaking, What's that? Like developing a hierarchy type thing. Right. They wanted a hierarchy, right? That's why we had the doctrinal analysis group, uh, the BRI, um, that, that would put the imprimatur of the Pope, or Parminder in this case, or Tess, upon anything that was going to be published by the movement. And that we couldn't even publish something unless it had gone through that. Now, originally the idea was it was just set up for, you know, the future news newsletter, but Jeff had never operated that way before. I mean, he would just basically, somebody would send him some letters or a piece of paper he found interesting, he would publish it, um, right? He would get 
letters to the editor and respond to them. You don't need a doctrinal analysis group to do that. And he definitely wasn't trying to control anything anybody else was publishing. So the doctrinal analysis group was used as a way of saying, I couldn't publish anything about July 18 because it hadn't had the approval of this committee. Now I was on the committee myself, so I was a member of the doctrinal analysis group. Um, it seemed that the only buddy, any person who actually even read the papers and made any comments was uh, Pat Rampey. Um, nobody else seemed to really comment on any of the papers. I would sometimes comment on the grammar or, uh, you know, typos and things like that. But, you know, how can we ana analyze somebody's doctrines per se? I mean, people are just writing what they understand. Um, we're not an authority to, to say, yes, you know, I mean, maybe we could question some of their ideas and give some suggestions. But what they wanted to have was like an imprimatur, you know, is this acceptable, what this person put in there? And there was really no discussion. So, you know, but this was all meant as a way, these were things put into control. So the message that came even just in by implication of somebody who's not really even a part of the movement per se, I mean, I'm not, wasn't officially anything, right? Just a member. I mean, we don't even really have members in this movement. I'm just a person, right? following the movement, whatever that means, writing papers and, you know, Jeff reading them and other people reading them and some people hating them. There's a lot of people who wanted Jeff to do something about me uh, in 2015 in the fall camp meeting, you know, the, the group from Alabama wanted him to address all of these errors I was teaching. Um, and then of course, in 2016, in the spring, you know, I met with Jeff, Heidi and I, and we went through what I had been uh, presenting. And Jeff says, well, it sounds all okay, right? And, and then he had me go to the, had us go as students at the School of the Prophets in 2016. So, um, I remember Jeff uh, commenting about these two brothers that had did a paper and he had, um, read it and um, then he identified who the, the two brothers were and this was I think it was in 2018 um, and the two brothers was Adilio and you yeah it was actually Adilio's paper but I mean discussions in Adilio I and I had yeah so I mean you know as late as 2018 he was he was going well this is right you know, so I agree with you with how he was doing things. Um, he was reading everything, bringing in everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, because how are you going to do it any other way? Everybody has to look at this stuff, you know, and then and then throw their not their seal on it. But, you know, you look at something, you, you, you're having trouble with you know, a concept that you see in there and you have to get it explained to you or something in that nature, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I get that part, but then there's this other stuff that, you know, you bring something in and then two or three other people go, Oh no, that's not really right. You know? And so that kind of gets eliminated, but you know, but, but there's a way, there's a way of addressing somebody who has that you think is teaching error. First thing you would do is you would write that person and have a discussion with them. Right. Right. So if you think somebody's teaching error, that, that's the thing that always amazes me is supposedly I was teaching error, but nobody's ever talking to me about it. Yeah, you did make that complaint a few times. Yeah, all they do is they would talk to others about it, right? And of course, distort what was happening. Well, now, that's, isn't that gossip at that point? The paper was in 2019, by the way. But, um, um, but yeah, Jeff was looking at all kinds of things. Now, of course, this opposition, Iran asked the question, would you have been able to go to the school without the opposition coming first? I don't know, particularly. I mean, I'd been, I'd presented in 2014. Uh, I didn't go in 2015 uh, when all this opposition was happening towards me. And then, you know, Jeff invited us to go 
in the summer semester in 2016. That's where I met Stephen. Um, but yeah, it, uh, I mean, God's in his providence. What I see is I see this message, that the message is not just about the 70 weeks and the 70 and the week of Christ and the 25, 20 and so forth. My view is that it has to do with how things are presented and, um, and, and how things are opposed. So I approach things quite a bit differently than many other people do. That is, I don't, um, you know, God's word is the authority. I don't believe in position and power as having, having any bearing upon whether something is true or not. And I believe that individuals need to study things for them to themselves to decide whether something is true or not. This is Jeff's position, right? That's what I've always felt he was like. But he was pushed into this direction. We need to have organization. And it was under a false pretense of that we look at the lines and we see that they have this gospel order. And so that's telling us to organize. And I didn't think that was correct. I don't think that that application made any sense. So organization was not what this movement needed then, nor is it what it needs now. We need to be ordered. That is, we need to be organized as individuals connected with Christ and communicate and work together with our brethren. Right. And, and the only way that can happen is if we're converted. Right. We, we can't. If if instead of conversion, you just create an institution. You really haven't solved the problem. Right. What you end up doing is pushing out the people who don't go along with the majority. Right. It, it, it just never works. So, so when we look at this message here, this, this message of Jotham, which we say is the 70th week, it's going to be about leadership, right? That these, that the previous judges, the trees, the people of Israel wanted to make them kings, but they didn't. But now you're going to have this bramble that's going to be king. And so this bramble represents... Not, not particularly a person, but it represents um, this maybe an organization, the organization that Parminder had tried to form, but that still still survived and in spirit. And, and we see that with the December 6, 2020 declaration, um, we see it acting as a king. Right now, we could talk about how um, Parminder, with uh, uh, the meeting on August 29th, uh, 2019, how they were uh, reviving the papacy. But, but if you have a king in a religious movement, you you have the papacy, don't you? The mixture of church and state. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I, I could never see how a church can function when you have that type of authority. Because you, you end up with, uh, well, with a, a religious tyranny, which is the papacy. So if something is true or it's not true. People need to be able to figure that out for themselves. You don't need some, some church protecting people from error. We already have this problem with the church with the 2520. Why did we want to set up an organization that was then going to say, well, you can't hear this message that somebody's writing because we didn't agree with it? How is that any different from the church? How is that even productive uh, to the advancement of truth? If your church members are so weak, that they can't see that it's error for themselves, then you have a pretty bad church. It's not going to survive. And they're just going to be calling for a king. 
because they want to follow somebody so they don't have to take on their own individual responsibility. Yeah, that's kind of what it's about. Yeah. So I think, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to go back to this line and, and say, you know, the first angel arrives. So I'm going to look at this as, um, I'm going to look at this line more personally, right? So maybe it's, it's not, I'm not saying I'm Samuel Snow or anything, but more personally in the con connection with the messages that were being given. And, and the first angel's message has to do with the chronology that was being presented in 2014. You know, we could say it arrived in 2014. It's formalized at the camp meeting. Maybe that's where it's formalized or maybe that's where it's empowered, right? So we'd have to figure that out. We could say, you know, when I personally arrived in the movement in 2010 and then it's formalized in 2014, um, at the camp meeting in Alberta and empowered in 2014. But it's, it's the entry of chronology into this movement in the way that we have studied it. So I don't know what dates I would put for those. Maybe somebody could arrive at something better. Um, but the second angel's message arriving, and, and we could even, you know, look at, you know, we got Samuel Snow's ledgers. We could look at the camp meeting uh, or the, um, you know, the different camp meetings. So we have 2016 as well. We also have when I taught at the School of the Prophets. So however, whatever dates you want to put there, I don't know what the best dates are, but it would all address everything prior to time setting. Right, that would be the first angels. That's the message of chronology. So, you know, we could put the School of the Prophets in there. We could put... You know, we could put 2014, 2016, 2017. I don't know. Um, but the second angel arriving um, would have to be the message in relation to time, right? So, so this would be connected with the, the validation of November 9th. 2019, but on October 13th, 2018. It well, wasn't that really when we, when everybody started waking up mm -hmm. and um, it was, it was 9-11 uh, or 11-9, if I'm not mistaken. That was the big, oh my God, you know, everybody drew back and just kind of, wow. Yeah. With, with Tess's prediction. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but then it's, it's going to be confirmed by all of the chronology that had gone before, right? So yes. all those studies that I had done previous to time setting. So when Tess comes out with that date, everything, you know, Revelation 9, Ezekiel, um, all of these things that, and, and that's maybe why 2016 is important because you got Ezekiel, um, as the empowerment of the first message. So 2016, Jeff says a lot of light's going to come from that. And, and then maybe you might say that the second angel arrives. If, if the earliest you could put it is dealing with Samuel Snow's letters in 2017. Um, so one thing you could do here is you could do, um, you could just take these things and place these as years, right? I mean, you could say, the third angel arrives in 2020. Uh, the empowerment is 2019. That's when July 18th is finally accepted by the movement and Jeff uh, presents it. You know, you could say it's formalized in 2018 with, on October 13th, 2018. It arrives in 2017, maybe with Samuel Snow's letters. You know, 2016, would it be its empowerment? 2014 is when I present time setting in Arkansas. And then, you know, it arrives. So the formalization here is, is, is uh, 2014. And then it arrives, you could, you know, from 2010 to 2014, you have this increase of light. So this would all really specifically relate to presentations that I've done to light that, that came 
through the studies that I was doing. First, just confirming the 2520 and establishing the chronology of the Bible. No intent of time setting. I mean, and Jeff did ask me that question in 2004. You know, are you using any of this to come to future dates? You know, before he asked me to come down to Arkansas and present in 2014, he wanted to know, you know, what, what are you doing with this? Say, you know, you got all this chronology, all these dates and things. Are you projecting any dates into the future? And, and, and he says he didn't remember to ask me that, but I remember it specifically. That would be a valid question. Yeah, because, you know, you know, here's this guy with all this chronology. Is he a time setter? I mean, that's kind of what I thought he was asking. me. Maybe maybe that wasn't what he was asking me, but that's the way it seemed to me. Um, so I assured him, you know, I wasn't trying to predict any events or set any dates or anything like that. I'm just analyze, analyzing uh, the prophecies in the Old Testament and New Testament that we could attach to time that, uh, you know, end uh, October 22nd, 1844. So no, no intention of, of time setting as such, didn't put anything into the future, didn't look for any patterns in the future. Um, but definitely um, we start to see that. Um, and if I'm gonna say that that's gonna be uh, 2017, we are, even though we don't have dates in 2017, we can take Samuel Snow's letters and I'm lining them up with what's happening in the movement. So, so that's a change that happens, which we could say is the arrival of the second angel. So, so there are ways, so we could just say, at least from the, the second way mark there, that's gonna be um, 2014, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. And, and in the end of that, I mean, how we would apply the parable to this, I'm not sure, because I would think the parable applies a little more broadly. But, um, you know, so I'm not sure if we could just take the, the olive and the fig and the vine and just, you know, place them somewhere. Maybe the bramble is, is what happens after, maybe, I don't know. But that's as far as, as we can get today. Hopefully that's that's helpful. It's a lot of discussion, a lot of different ideas. And some of them, you know, just our memories and sort of speculative on how to understand this. But um, now I put there the 777 because originally, you know, I was going to say, well, this is going to go from uh, November uh, you know, November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. But there might be some other way in which we understand this, um, not as 777 days, um, but in some other way. So that we could still use that symbol. I don't know. Okay, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? The one thing, you know, that I really want, I would really like to see in these studies, I mean, please um, give me some feedback, either by emails, um, you know, or even writing on the YouTube videos, because we really need to figure this out. And, and I don't want to be the one sort of figuring it out for everyone. So anyway, let's, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love. And we pray, Lord, that um, uh, you can be with us throughout this day. Thank you for the truths in your word. And help us, Lord, to set aside our preconceived ideas and attitudes regarding others, but to recognize that you are working upon the hearts of all around us. And um, we just ask that we can work and cooperate with you. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.